And I would like probably do this a couple of Wednesday nights, not next, but the following, unless it takes one, uh, one or two for Christmas. But uh, tonight I want to talk about the superiority of the King James Bible. Now you take it for granted because most of you, that's all you've heard since you've been saved, is the Bible, the Word of God, and God preserved His words in English in the King James Bible. You've just believed that ever since you've been saved, and I did too. Um, but most of the professing churches and preachers in America do not believe that. And if you're not careful, you'll hear all these guys on the radio and TV, and uh, none of which, none of which believe the King James Bible. I don't, I don't know of, of, of a famous preacher on TV that believes the King James Bible is God's preserved word, except maybe Jimmy Swagger. He's the only one that I know of other than him, I don't know of a national ministry guy who, do, who believes it. And the reason is their education. And so they're, they're taught different. So we're going to take a little while tonight and study. I've got some uh, up here tonight. Uh, I've got the NIV. This is the New International Version. This is the most popular Bible among, uh, I guess, you know, what we'd say Baptist uh, churches, Pentecostal, um, apostolic, assembly of God, stuff like that, people that preach uh, in, in America. This is the New World Translation. That's the Jehovah Witness Bible. This right here is the Youth Study Bible, New Century Version. This is the Everyday Bible. Uh, I, I guess that implies that the old one you wouldn't read every day, but you would this one. And this is good news uh, America, God loves you. Now, you might be sitting there tonight and say, well, what do you care about all that stuff for, preacher? What does it matter? I'm going to show you what it matters. It matters a heap, a whole bunch. And so tonight, uh, let's see. Let's just, uh, let's start by going over some things that I've done here before. And uh, I believe, I believe in God's providence and plan, he has preserved his words in English in the King James Bible. I believe that. I believe that, and I believe that for several reasons. Now, immediately when you say that, some preacher, I got critiqued not long ago. Some, uh, some preacher uh, was preaching in his church, and I just happened to get it for some reason or another, and he was preaching, and he, he told his church, he said, church, the King James Bible is not perfect. And he said, Danny Castle would kick a chair over if he heard me say that. He said, that on the Internet. I just happened to hear it. And he, I said, amen, brother. I'm glad you feel that way. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Now, the question comes up, if it's not the Word of God, where is the Word of God? If it's not, you say, well, it's not perfect. Well, what parts are and what parts are not? Are you able to pick and choose what's the Bible and what's not the Bible? Let's, let's talk about this for a little while tonight. I'm going to get in no hurry, and I'm going to get some of you guys to help me and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about we're going to stay a long time tonight. I'm saying I'm not going to finish it all tonight when I say that. Um, one guy jumped up and he said, Preacher, what you don't understand is that there is a bunch of changes in the original 1611 Bible and the Bible that we call the 1611 Bible now. Because up until 1769... Uh, they say it was revised. That's a tricky word there. Now, how many of y'all have ever heard somebody say that? Well, you don't even use the real King James Bible. That, that's the 1769 edition that we're using. Anybody ever heard that? Raise your hand. Now, when they say that, they're, they're not, they're not playing, playing fair with you. Uh, uh, the, the changes that were made from, the changes that were made from 1611 to 1769 were not changes in the wording. They were changes in spelling. I've got a copy of the, of, of the original 1611 uh, Bible. I don't know if I got it here. I think it's in, at home. And they, they put out some editions of the 1611 Bible back in, in uh, 2011. That was the 400th anniversary. That's what that sign back there on that wall was uh, celebrating, the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. And, and you know what? Uh, they, 
they change the spelling. As the language, they, they, it, it purified the spelling. For example, in the, the original one, it would say music, the word music, it would be M-U-S-I-C-K, which was later, the K was dropped and changed to music. That's not a change in the text. It still says the same thing. The new versions of the Bible don't change the spelling. They change the wording. And here's what I want you to get. And you, I don't expect everybody in here to be a Greek scholar. I ain't, don't want to be. Uh, I, I've studied it enough to know what I'm talking about. And what, we, what they don't understand and what most preachers do not understand is that all the new versions of the Bible that you see at the Lifeway store in Hickory or anywhere you order them online or anywhere, all new versions of the Bible come from these two Greek manuscripts. That's where they were translated from. This is called Vaticanus. That's called Sinaiticus. Uh, immediately, what's, there's a thought that strikes your mind when you say this one, Vatican. That's Catholic. And then there's a word that strikes your mind when you see that one. Uh, uh, maybe it's, it's probably pure coincidence. But these were two Greek manuscripts that were discovered in 1880. See, 1600, 1700, 1800, everybody had the same Bible. Everybody had the same Bible. That one right there. Then these two manuscripts were discovered, and somebody said, oh, my goodness, these are older than that manuscript. That, see that where it says Texas Receptus over there? That, these are older, so therefore they must be more accurate. And the whole generation of Christians fell off, got off track. Great men like R.A. Torrey. R.A. Torrey was a great man, soul winner. And some of those men were very learned men and studious men. But when this came out, they said, oh my goodness, Maybe they're right. Maybe, maybe there was one here. And our King James Bible was taken from Textus Receptus. That means received, and that means text. Backward, received text. Common people, common people. Now, let's we'll study a little bit about that tonight. And King James, on the throne in England, gave the order to translate the Bible in 1604. That was an answer to William Tyndale's prayer about 50 years before that, when William Tyndale was burning at the stake, he put his Bible in English, and his last dying prayer was, Lord, while the flames was coming up him, buddy. I mean, these guys wasn't sitting around in an air-conditioned office with a, with a drink machine, you know, and a publishing company ready to sign a deal. No, no, I'm talking about the guys on fire. These people meant business, buddy. It wasn't a money-making scheme. And he said, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. And King James gave the word to, pub, to translate the scriptures in 1604. From 1604 to 1611, that's seven years. It came out May the 2nd, 1611. Now listen to this. They chose 54 of the smartest, most learned scholars of that day. They were divided into six groups. They didn't all study together. This took some scriptures. Went over yonder. This took Cambridge, Oxford, Westminster. They studied all, and they studied parts. They studied parts. Every now and then they'd get together and compare scriptures. Unbiased, undenominational. These guys were different denominational beliefs. They weren't even Baptists, most of them. Uh, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to read you a little bit about a couple of these guys. I have the list right here of all 54 of them. Westminster, Cambridge, Oxford, Westminster, Cambridge, Oxford. They were divided up into six groups. 54 of these guys. Let me give you just a little bit of their credentials. Now, handling the Word of God don't necessarily mean a smart person has to do it. But this is for people who say, Oh, these guys over here were a lot smarter and more learned than them guys. Let's see. Let's see about that. Uh, John Boyes, he was one of the translators going from the Textus Receptus to the King James Bible. Let me read you about him. When he was five years old, his father taught him to read Hebrew. Read Hebrew. 
By the time he was six, he could write Hebrew and in a fair and elegant character. By age 15, he was a student at St. John's College in Cambridge where he was renowned for corresponding with his superiors in Greek. So he knew Greek and Hebrew by the time he was 15 years old. Though, though engulfed with his studies, Boyce made time for his mother, frequently hiking some 20 miles just to have breakfast with her. He would read as he walked. His devouring of over 60 grammars made him one of the most popular Greek professors at Cambridge with students attending his voluntary lectures as early as 4 a.m. in the morning. He would give voluntary lectures of Greek at 4 o'clock in the morning and people would come out to hear him. So this guy wasn't no dummy. Afterwards, he would remain with his books until 8 p.m. They didn't have TV. They didn't have internet. They didn't have all the attractions or nothing. Eight, four in the morning till eight at night in books. Of the man destined to become a committee's final editor, he was so familiar with the Greek Testament that he could at any time turn to any word that it contained. He could show you any verse in the New Testament just like that. The secret to such a consecrated life can be summed up in the translator's own words who said, quote, There has not been a day for these many years which I have not had meditated at least once upon my death. He said, All these years I thought about the day I die and the day I have to face God. Name the 20th century scholars who could shine the shoes of a guy like that. And then we have Dr. Lancelot Andrews, chairman of the New Testament Committee at Westminster, who was conversant in 15 languages. It was said of Miles Smith that he was a very walking library. His attitude was that of covetous nothing but books. That's all he wanted was books. Uh, he was at the privilege of writing the New Bible's preface. George Abbott entered Oxford at 14 years of age and became the Archbishop of Canterbury. Andrew Drowns was described by Milton as the chief of learned men in England. The literary accomplishments of Thomas Ravis at Oxford were representative of the translators as a whole. Uh, he was a living library. He was reading and famous in doctrine and the very present of knowledge and learning. That's just two or three of these guys. There are 54 of them. They worked at it. They translated it. And by the way, they believed that they were handling the very words of God. They believed it. And they were meticulous in their, in their, uh, uh, their translation. People say this. Here, here's what a lot of preachers say. And I know most, most preachers in Burke County who are educated do not believe the King James Bible is perfect and the Word of God. And the reason is because 90% of the schools teach them that these manuscripts are superior, therefore they, they're changed. Well, we're going to see about that in just a minute. Um, uh, they say this. They say only the original manuscripts were, quote, inspired, dictated by God, and all we have now is copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. Now, when you hear when you hear a preacher on TV, when you hear any modern preacher, when you hear any contemporary preacher, I don't name 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 anyone you want, any one of them. When they say the Bible's the Word of God, they ain't talking about that book they got in their hand. They don't mean that. They mean the Bible was inspired at one time, and all we got is a fairly good copy of it. Ask them they believe that one's inspired. Oh, no, no, I don't mean that. I mean the Bible. What, what's the Bible? The original manuscript. Now, does anybody know what the word Bible means? It means book. The original manuscripts were never together in a book, ever. Never have been. They were wrote over a period of like 1,600 years by 40 different men who never even knew each other. Now, let me tell you something, people. Paul told Timothy, preach the word. Did Timothy have the original manuscripts? No way. They were a thousand years old, what Moses wrote when Timothy got saved. So what was Timothy supposed to preach? Let me tell you what Jesus Christ said. 
Jesus, in Luke chapter 4 and verse 21, called it Scripture. What Jesus had in his day, he said, was Scripture. That was not the original manuscript. They couldn't last that long. They couldn't last thousands of years. No, no way. Jesus didn't have the original, yet he called it Scripture. You know what uh, uh, John said about Paul's writings? He said some people rest his word as they do the other Scriptures. Talking about Paul's writing being Scripture. Now, you'll hear a lot of these guys say, uh, the Scripture said, the Scripture said. Listen to the TV preacher. They always say, the Scripture said. And what they mean when they say that is the original manuscripts. Ask them, can you show me the Scripture? And they'll say, well, it's in the library. By comparing this and this and this and this, we can pretty much figure out what God said. So what we're facing today in our generation of Christianity, and that's why it's all, most of these churches are built on music and emotions and, you know, 45-minute altar call with soft organ music playing on people's emotions is this. Preachers no longer believe that the Bible has the words of God. They believe it just has the message of God. The general message is Jesus died for our sins, he rose again, that's the message, but you can't go saying this, every word of it is inspired of God. That's a very dangerous thought. Let's take just a minute and look at a couple, okay? A couple of verses of Scripture. Um, let me get me some men up here. Aunt, get on the front row. Can you read? Uh, they teach you to read in Tennessee. Uh, Aunt, Brother Derek, uh, come on up here and... Uh, I'm going to get you to, I'm going to give you the NIV, and Brother Derek, I'm gonna, I haven't even checked this one out. I'm going to give you the New Century version of the, of the scripture, scripture here, and uh, can you see it? Uh, somebody help the old man out over here, Jason. Uh, grab that Bible there. Uh, okay. All right, I'm, I'm going to. I'm on, all right, let's get the New World Translation here while we're at it. Brian, come up here and sit on the front row. This is Jehovah Witness Bible. Anybody ever had a Jehovah Witness come to your house, knock on your door? Uh, you know somebody is, a, is, a, is something weird about somebody when they knock on your door and they won't tell you what they are. Amen. They'll beat around a bus two hours and say, we'd like to get you in a Bible study. Well, what are, well we're from the Watchtower Society. Well, what's that? They won't say we're Jehovah's Witnesses. I wouldn't belong to something I'm ashamed of. All right? Let me show you something here. Let's just look at a verse of Scripture here. Everybody take your Bible and turn to Zechariah chapter 13. Everybody. Uh, Zechariah chapter number 13. And uh, I want to show you something here tonight. I got another one at home and I forgot it. I was wanting to, this one was really, really unbelievable. Uh, Zechariah 13. And there's a prophecy here about the Lord Jesus being crucified, and he said here in, in verse 6, and one shall say unto him, this is 13, 6, Zechariah, next to the last book in the, Old, in the uh, Old Testament, and one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer those which I was wounded in the house of my friends. That's exactly what happened. Jesus, the wounds in the hands of Jesus, he is wounded in the house of his friends. Uh, the Jews had him crucified, the Roman soldiers put nails in his hands, and it was. And G, you know what Jesus called Judas when he come up? Somebody tell me, friend, friend. So the, the King James Bible is exactly right. Clear. What does yours say, brother Jason? It says, uh, "Someone will ask, what are them two cuts on your body?" <laughs> and, and and each will answer, "I was hurt at my friend's house." Well, that's a lot closer than the one I got. Now, look what your Bible says. Now, everybody look at it again. I was wounded in the house of my friends. Do you know what the, you know what the um, uh, ESB, I believe it's an ESB. I got it at home and I forgot to bring it. It says, oh, the living Bible. Nobody ain't got no living Bible. You know what the living Bible says? I got into a brawl at a friend's house. What it says, recommended by Billy Graham, and I'm not I'm not being critical of Billy Graham. How could, you know what you say? Well, people wouldn't do, 
I got into a brawl. There's a lot of difference between the Son of God stretching his hand out and letting them nail hands in hand. Listen, brother, if he'd have got into a brawl, they'd have been the ones got the wounds. He didn't get in no brawl. Listen to this one. N-E-B, New English Bible. I got these wounds in the house of my lovers. In the house of my lovers? They said, what's these scars on your chest? And he said, in the house of my lovers. That's some sick stuff there. That ain't the Bible. There's no word in the Bible where it talks about wounds on Jesus' chest. And there's a big difference between the house of my lovers and the house of my friends. What's yours say? Aunt? If someone asked him, what are these, these wounds on your body? He would answer, the wounds I was given at the house of my friends. Okay, that was close. What is that, the NIV? Mm -hmm. That's very, very close. What's yours say, brother? Oh, okay. Brian? Jehovah Witness Bible. Those which I was stuck in the house of my intense lovers. I don't know how they get that. That's the difference between that Greek and that Greek. You see, what they tell you is, well, they just make it easy to understand. Them these and thous. I mean, our poor old mammals and papals never went to the third grade, but they could figure out these and thous. And us, the highly educated Americans, can't figure out what thee and thou and dust and hath and it means. Anybody got a comment on that verse right there? I'm going to just, I'm just show you there's thousands of them. We'll just take two or three tonight. Anybody? All right, let's look at another one. Genesis 49. Take your Bible. Turn to Genesis 49. I'm telling you, buddy, your King James Bible said he was wounding the house of his friends. He called Judas Iscariot his friends, a friend that betrayed him, and that's exactly right. Now, this verse here, it's just a random sort of a verse. I'm not, it doesn't really affect no major doctrine necessarily <laughs> that I know of, but uh, you never know. Uh, Genesis 49, 6. Everybody look at Genesis 49, 6. It says this, O oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Is that what your Bible says? All right, what does yours say, Brother Jason? I will not join their secret thoughts. I will not meet with them upon evil. They killed men because they were angry, and they crippled the ox, which is from us. My anger there uh, is cursed because it is too violent. They crippled the ox because it is fun. Now, our says they dig down a wall. That says they crippled an ox because it was fun. What does yours say, Brian? Uh, the evil infinite will not come. O oh, my soul, let their trouble go. Do not become united with their mind. Be guilty and cause a death on the ground. They killed men in the day of their killing. <laughs> the one that I got at home says they, they hamstring oxen. Now, did they dig down a wall or hamstring an oxen? What does your saying? Just the last part. You don't have to read that first part. They hamstring oxen as they please. Where did that come from? How did? That's what this says, I'm assuming. This one says they dig down a wall. That one says they hamstring oxen. Now, they both can't be right. People say, well, all, all the new versions do is just make it a little bit clearer to write. Really, they're all right. If they disagree with each other, they can't all be right. One of them's wrong or both of them's wrong. But they ain't both right. Amen? Yeah, dig down a wall. Yeah. Does anybody in here know what hamstring and oxen mean? 
Would anybody like to tell us what hamstring and oxen mean? That sounds terrible. <laughs> I know what a hamstring is on us, but I don't know about. It was fun, whatever it was. Crazy nut, man. Um, uh, now let's take one a little more serious. James chapter 5. The book of James chapter 5. And, and get your Bibles, please. This James is right after Hebrews. James chapter 5. If you'll mark these and write a little note at the beginning of your Bible, you can use them to show people when they try to tell you you're crazy and old-fashioned and medieval and archaic and outdated and, and, and you know, your old Bible can't be understood. James 5, verse number 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. All I want is that first line. Brother Jason, 16, the first line. It's hard to find because they mix it up. They put the numbers in the middle of the verses, trying to make it read like a, a paragraph. Go ahead. That's it. Confess your sins to each other and pray each other. Pray for each other and pray God for you. Confess your sins to each other. That's a false doctrine. That is a that's a strong Roman Catholic teaching. You see that Vatican? See that Vatican? See that? Those kind of, those texts kind of have a Roman Catholic slant to them. The Bible nowhere teaches that you have to confess your that's what confessing your sins to a priest. You don't con, if we're sitting around here and I'm sick, it says we'll confess our faults to each other. I can sit around and say, look, y'all, man, I really need to do better at this and I, I want y'all to pray for me and everything but as far as me coming to you and confessing my sins uh-uh I don't confess mine to you you don't confess mine to me Amen. I don't want to hear your sins I think bad enough of you already <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing with you alright what was your saying therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be alright what was your say Brian Every one of them says confess your sins. Every one of them, except your King James Bible. That's that manuscript. All of them are this manuscript. Here's the uh, Good News America. Let's see what it says here. Uh, Therefore, confess your sins one to another. That's false doctrine. That ain't right, y'all. That ain't right. You don't confess your sins to one to another. All right, turn to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. And I hadn't checked these. I'm just hitting them at random here tonight. Uh, did you know that these manuscripts over here believe that the last, uh, I don't know, nine verses of Mark are not even supposed to be in the Bible. None of them believe the last nine verses, I believe, are even supposed to be in the Bible. Let me check my, uh, my reference here. Uh, Mark uh, 16, no, I'm sorry, beginning with verse 9. Uh, 9 to 20. From verse 9 on to verse 20 is not supposed to be in it. And this is talking about uh, uh, the Great Commission and the miracles and signs and wonders and the Lord confirming them with signs following. And now, now, if that ain't supposed to be in the Bible, let's quit reading it, quit preaching it, if it's not supposed to be in there. Now, what does y'all say on your notes? Yeah, right above it, it says, 9, and 20, 9 through 20 are not included in two of the best and oldest Greek manuscripts. See that? Everybody hear that? Read that again, brother. It says, 9 through 20 are not included in two of the best and oldest Greek manuscripts. See that? It's got it in there because they know nobody ain't going to buy it if it don't. But it tells you it ain't supposed to be. How crooked is that? If I really believed it wasn't supposed to be in there, I wouldn't put it in there. If I was printing a Bible and I believed it wasn't supposed to be in there, I'd leave them out, wouldn't you? Now, what makes somebody put something in the Bible that, ain't, that they don't believe is supposed to be in there but tells you it ain't supposed to be? Love of money. Selling books. They're selling books. What was your saying? Uh, the earliest manuscripts and no other ancient references do not have Mark 19, Mark, Mark 19, 9 through 20. 
right? He said the earliest manuscripts don't have it. What does yours say, Brian? Or does it have a note? What does it say? I reckon. I don't know. The question comes up, is it supposed to be in the Bible or not? You say, how do you know? By their fruit, you shall know them. That's what Jesus said. That's the infallible law of the Lord Jesus Christ. By their fruit, you shall know them. There's been more fruit produced by the King James Bible and preaching and teaching revivals throughout the world than any, all the other books ever printed put together. There's been more copies of that book spread around. 900 million, or probably a billion by now, of any other book that's the most printed book ever in the history of the world, the most memorized book ever printed in the world, by their fruit you shall know them. All right. Uh, does anybody have a question or a comment out here? Would you agree with the footnote? Some people get stirred up that phrase, they love Jesus, the oldest is greatest. Yeah. Those are not, the oldest is not the best. And they actually equate that automatically is the most old. That's right. The oldest ones are supposed to have evidence of tampering on the right. And, and there's a lot of evidence that I've, I've again, this book right here, The Final Authority by William Grady, is one of the greatest books on this subject you never get. You need to, everybody in here needs to read that book. Forget getting it at a bookstore. They won't sell them. They won't sell Chick Tracks. They won't sell Gil Ripplinger's books. And people talk about, you know, Ruckman, he's too mean. Well, this guy ain't mean. But he teaches the exact same thing. Exact same thing. Just stews it down where you can swallow it. And listen, uh, this book, Final Authority, every adult Christian in here needs to familiarize himself with this book. I ain't read it all, but I, I know this guy. I've met this guy in person, and uh, he's a good guy. And Gail Ripplinger's got some of the most amazing stuff of anybody on it. She's on the internet. All i got to do put her name in, Gail Ripplinger. Yeah, I rebuke you, devil. Uh, amen. Did some, something must have happened to my uh, battery, y'all. It was left off. It's trying. Uh, so we're, I'm about done anyway, but let's just take, is it on back there, the little one? Huh, it's acting weird. All right. Uh, let me just show you another one right quick. And this is one most of you already know because you come here to church, but let's get to Acts chapter 8, and then I'm gonna, we'll do some other stuff later. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish with this. Acts chapter number 8, and what they're going to tell you, if you go to a bookstore, they're going to say, well, there's really no difference in the NIV and the King James Bible. It just leaves out the these and the thous. And sometimes them people working in bookstores really believe that because that's what somebody told them to say. But they have no clue what they're talking about. Uh, Acts chapter 8, this is the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, the first man in the New Testament that gets, that it's clear, saved by grace through faith plus nothing. Is Acts chapter 8, verse 37. I didn't say the first one got saved. I said it's the first one that's made clear like that. Look at here. Uh, Jesus, I mean, Philip preached to him about Jesus in verse 35. Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He said, okay, I believe on the Lord. Uh, what I got to do to get baptized? And Philip said, verse 37, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He got saved right there in that verse. He said, if you believe with all your heart, you can get baptized. Now, if you don't believe, I ain't going to baptize you. I ain't going to baptize babies. I ain't going to baptize infants. That's what they thought about with that Catholic church. Remember back in January when I preached on that? I'm not going to do it. But if you you're, know what you're talking about and you know that Jesus is real and you believe on him, I'll baptize you. 37 is where that happened. What is your saying, 37? 
says, didn't the officer come in and Terry stop most of the officer went down the yard? There ain't no 37. But he did put a footnote. It says, some late copies putting down the machine guns, I guess. Yep. Some late copies add verse 37. That's so people won't flip out. So that one says 34, 35, 36, 38. Why would you do that? Why didn't you just make 38, 37, and 39, 38, and 40, 39? Why would you put 36, 38? Sell Bibles. Sell Bibles. Ain't that something? What's your saying? There ain't no verse 37 in, that, in the NIV. It's not in there. Now you tell me I'm not, I don't mean to be ugly, folks. I, I'm not, I am not worthy to shine Charles Stanley's shoes. He's a better man than I'll ever be. But you can't tell me that them got, that like him, that people like David Jeremiah, people like that, they have no, do they not know that? Do they not know that? Or they don't care? Or what's, what's the deal with that? What if the Lord laid on your heart to preach on that guy getting saved in Acts 8, 37? Would you have to say, excuse me, mine don't have it in there. Get my King James back over here so I can preach on that. Sure would. You sure would. But I'm not trying to be an ugly troublemaker. I'm just trying to face the facts. Do we have the Bible or not? We got God's word or not? We do. We do. I'm telling you, the, the, the best practice is the practice of our old preaching forefathers. You take that book like it stands, and it's a two-edged sword, and it will get the job done. Amen? Amen. All right, anybody got a question? I'm going to stop right there. Question or comment? Yeah, sure did. Sure did. I don't know. I really don't know. Surely he did. Surely he did. Now, the minute you say that, people say, oh, I can't believe you criticized that great man. I'm not criticizing them, okay? Chill out. It's okay. I'm just trying to help our church know what we believe and why we believe it. That's all. Nothing personal. All them better men than I'll ever be. Anybody else? 